Welcome back to Movies TV Mad. You can follow me on Twitter at Movies TV Mad, on Instagram at Movies TV Mad Triple Five, and on TikTok at Movies TV Mad Triple X. And welcome to Wednesday's edition of the DCEU Daily. And today we tell the story of the DCEU. This story is not for the faint hearted. This video should be shown to every studio executive in Hollywood on how not to form a, a shared cinematic universe. Everyone should watch this. I know that's very arrogant of me, but I'm not only going to go through the story of the DCEU, but explain why this should never have happened the way that it did. So, let's go back a long time ago to this film, Man of Steel, from a screen story from Christopher Nolan and David S. Goya. In fact, Man of Steel was the brainchild of David S. Goya while he had a bit of writer's block for The Dark Knight Rises. He saw an alien invasion saga, putting Superman in the real world. How would people react to this alien with the power of a god? And so um, Christopher Nolan went to Warner Brothers, pitched it to WB, the leadership then. The leadership then is very different to the leadership now. That's very important to understand. One of the lessons that must be learned from the DC Cinematic Extended Universe is never have all tours running a cinematic franchise, especially when people have preconceived ideas from the characters you're about to adapt. You see, you can go back to George Lucas in the original trilogy, who is a writer-director and was a writer-director. Nobody had preconceived ideas about Star Wars A New Hope when that man formatted that idea based on iconic stories from the past, moulded into a brand new story. Autors will never give you what you need. Let's look at the MCU. The MCU is run by a producer who also understands storytelling. Basically, Kevin Feige formed Marvel Studios and put the right people in the right positions. But knowing he could run it, run it as a producer and run it as a storyteller. He has that rare gift of being able to use his mind as a storyteller and a showrunner, but also put his production head on. That's the unique kind of qualities of Kevin Feige. Zack Snyder doesn't care about the studio system. All tours don't care about the studio system. So basically Warner Brothers didn't go to Christopher Nolan to form the DCEU. He went to them because his friend and writer and the person who helped him form this awesome epic um, Dark Knight trilogy had an idea for a Superman movie. It was Warner Brothers who said we need to make this into a cinematic universe. So why did they go and bring in Zack Snyder? They brought in Zack Snyder because Christopher Nolan believed with the kind of visual and artistic integrity that Zack has he was the best man to do an epic, beautifully looking Superman movie. And in that element, it succeeded hands down. But Warner Brothers should never have, over, have okayed this. Never, ever, ever. Because they partly, you know, were involved in the production of Watchmen. They knew how the public responded to Watchmen, especially... The, the fans of the graphic novel, Alan Moore himself, right? So they knew that this was a controversial guy who puts in his own takes. Now, Watchmen is a glorious movie for me because I've never read the comics. But I'm sure if I did, I would have issues of this telling and that adaption of that graphic novel. So you never put all tours in charge of a cinematic universe, especially one as huge as DC. You know, you want someone like Kevin Feige, because as I say, he has the storytelling quality and he can put the, you know, he can put his production head on as well. That's the unique quality of Kevin Feige. So this was doomed to fail from the beginning. I tell you what, my stomach sunk into the pit of my armpits when I found out 
Christopher Nolan wasn't directing this Man of Steel movie. Because that was the assumption I made when I heard he was, you know, going to godfather the DC Extended Universe. But he wasn't doing it. He claimed he couldn't make a Superman movie as well as somebody else could. Now, it's well documented and he's very honest about it. Christopher Nolan didn't go to film school. He literally learned how, where to point a camera and about camera angles and stories. And, he, you know, he, he, he's a very good director, but he didn't go to, he didn't go to film school. Uh, like a lot of us did. But a lot of people who have gone to film school were not necessarily great directors. I believe Christopher Nolan, if he directed this film, and if he directed the next one, and the arc-based movies, right, maybe we could have had a different story. But still, he's an auteur. He went and got another auteur, one of the most controversial auteurs in the business. From the moment we realized that he didn't want to mold this franchise, it was a problem. But the truth of the matter was that once David S. Scoyer kind of pitched his story, they should have brought in someone like, you know, I've mentioned it before, Bruce Timm. Bruce Timm is exactly what Kevin Feige is. And he would have made the right decisions with Man of Steel. And I know that recently Bruce said he kind of looked at Zack Snyder killing... Uh, Avin Superman Kills Zod, it was actually David S. Goyer's pitch for Superman to do that. And he said he wanted um, Superman to kill Doomsday in one of his movies. Well, killing Doomsday, Bruce, is very different than Superman snapping Zod's neck. Let's be absolutely clear about that. Now, that's something that didn't trigger me, and it still doesn't trigger me. But Superman never learned any lessons from that, did he? If Superman's going to kill for the first time in a Superman Begins type of movie, I want him to say, I know what it's like to kill. I never want to feel that way again. It's a lesson. And you want to hear this at the end of the first film so no one can come at you. If he says that to Martha at Jonathan's grave at the end, it's a huge moment. And people say, even though people lose their shit when they see Superman do that, at least Superman has learned from it. Superman doesn't learn from it. Snyder doesn't learn from it and already you have a problem. Man of Steel made about 665, 670 million in the global box office, which was a solid return. And at the time, it was a joint record with the first Raimi Spider-Man film, by the way, because origin superhero movies didn't make that much money. But for Warner Brothers, they felt that Superman should have made more money. So they blamed Christopher Nolan and David Goyer for this, so out the door they went. Now, obviously, um, Goya had already written a sequel to Man of Steel, so they used elements of it, but it was rewritten pretty much and thrown in the bin by Chris Terrio, who by this time was Bruce, uh, sorry, Ben Affleck's man, Bruce Wayne's man, Ben Affleck's man. And so, because Zack Snyder had already cast Ben Affleck. Now, Christopher Nolan actually wanted Ben Affleck, before he even went to Zack, to direct Man of Steel, and Ben felt as a director, he wasn't ready to do that. I think the results would have been interesting. Um, maybe Ben Affleck would have been a better person to run the DC Extended Cinematic Universe. We will never know. But I will still stand by the point that, that you need a producer and a storyteller. And producers and storytellers in one person are a rarity. That's why there is only one Kevin Feige, as I see, as I say. Now, the critics, some critics hated Man of Steel, some critics loved it. It was a mixed bag. Some people loved it, some people hated it. But anything that people didn't like in Man of Steel, like Superman killing and the destruction, could have been changed in the sequel. But there was one issue, of course. Zack Snyder was going to be the director of the sequel, so that wasn't going to happen. So now we go to, where are we? This film. Batman vs. Superman, Dawn of Justice. WB and DC decided that Superman couldn't sell a movie on his own. They lost faith in Superman more than they did in Goyer and Nolan and Snyder. That's interesting. Because I believe if you tell a Superman story in the right way for a broader audience, it can work. I have so many ideas for a Superman movie. One of the things you've got to do is remember he is the ultimate illegal immigrant right? 
In my story, Superman wouldn't be a baby when he arrives, right? He's maybe 12 years old, 13, a teenager or something, right? And when he lands, he's detected by the government. He has to get out of his ship quickly and run through the night, through the cornfields of Smallville. And he's being hunted. Then he's discovered by the Kents. So we get that atmosphere of an illegal immigrant hiding from the authorities and being hunted. They, you know, the ship's there. Maybe they even discover his ship. I don't know. But that will be a, a more compelling story. So already you get that feeling of an illegal immigrant hiding from the world in Smallville and being brought up from 12, 13 years old by the Kents. And I think that would be a, a more interesting scenario. So when Clark Kent becomes a man, he's already got this story. And you need to make Clark interesting. You need to make Superman interesting because he can't just stand there saying yes and no man. We're in, tw we're in the 21st century now. So you have to find, find a bit of humor within him. He has to, you know, he has to have a few lines, you know. One I created when I was writing one Superman story is when someone shoots him and he goes, where have you been, the Phantom Zone? Because what it does is, it's humour him saying, well, it's obvious. I'm Superman, it's obvious. You can't shoot me, what, what are you doing? But you make him interesting and you give him a compelling story. Maybe Lara and jor fly with him at the age of 13 to Earth, but they get split up. And maybe something happens to jor or, or Martha. One of them dies, but one of them lives and, be, and becomes a villain and becomes corrupted by Western society. And someone in the government uses Lara, maybe, for wrong and manipulates it, whatever. And then it, by the end of the film, Superman has to fight his own mother or something like that. I've even written one about Metallo. Um, which, which would be re really would be about Superman's no-kill policy, right? So even though some people didn't like Man of Steel, right? As I say, those issues that the broader audience and the broader critics didn't like could have been fixed. No can do because Batman versus Superman: Dawn of Justice. The, I mean, this is the Ultimate Edition, but we didn't have the Ultimate Edition at the time. One thing about Man of Steel: Nolan made sure that Warner Brothers didn't interfere with that movie. That's why you'll never get a director's cut. There's no interesting footage to show of that film. That is a director's and a writer's movie. So, Batman vs. Superman was a three-hour movie that was cut two and a, by half an hour to two and a half hours. It had begun. Warner Brothers realised they had a problem with Snyder. The problem is, cutting it down wasn't the issue. The length of the movie isn't the issue. This movie isn't going to be something the broader audience are going to sit there and like. Because what you do, you're deconstructing the characters they've read and watched all their lives. It's never going to sit well with a mainstream audience. If you make it an R-rated movie um, for cinema, something else worldy, yes, people say, wow, well, this is interesting, like they did with the Joker. Maybe if you make Joker like a DCEU movie, it isn't going to work, is it? Because they say, nah, nah, this, this doesn't fit. But... As a, an Elseworld story, Todd Phillips' Joker is fantastic. And so could have this been. The problem with this film is it was marketed badly. It was marketed a lot. The trailers were fantastic. But they told us we were going to get a central universe, block, you know, mainstream blockbuster with Superman and Batman fighting. But it was all wrong from the very beginning. As much as I love the film and I love its themes and I think it's great. The point being, you know... Um, Warner Brothers seemed to lose faith in Superman, so they just threw Batman in there. Um, it was just, you know, Superman and Batman. This is a sell. As some people say it's too soon. This film was actually supposed to launch. The kind of, it's called Dawn of Justice. It's supposed to launch or hint to the other Justice League members as well. So this film had, you know, really big shoes to fill and had a big job to do. But this is a film of an all the thing is with this film mostly, this is Chris Terrio's story, but it's Zack Snyder's visual vision. But Zack Snyder also had a story to tell with BVS as well. Zack's not really much of a writer, if I'm honest. And he hasn't written and directed many of his movies, if I'm right. I don't know if he's done one or two, and we saw with Army of the Dead. 
Uh, him writing his movies may be not the best thing, but we will see what happens with Rebel Moon, a film I'm really very much looking forward to. So, the public rejected the theatrical release of this film. This film had record-breaking opening box office scores. Um, you know, it, it, it made a lot of money, but the drop-off was astronomical. The reviews were scathing. A lot of the audience didn't like it. When I saw it, I thought this was going to get nominated for Oscars. Little did I know. Because, you know, the MCU had already, had already been doing its thing. And the DCEU was being compared. This is not what people expected, were told they were going to see, and it wasn't what people were wanting what people wanted. Now, if the marketing was honest, like Logan was honest, maybe people would have embraced this film a lot more. But the cutoff of 30 minutes from three hours to two and a half hours was very, very problematic. So then they did the extended version, right? Which made a lot of sense, right? So the mistakes already happened. It was already embarrassing for Warner Brothers and Zack Snyder because there was a divide between the studio and the director. The problems of an auteur running a franchise, the problems already started. So this film is the film that destroyed everything. Everything. The audience now were treating this franchise as a joke and were memeing, you know, the Martha moment. I like the Martha moment, by the way, but it was being memed. This film caused a huge divide through fans, consumers, critics, uh, movie makers, people within the industry, everyone had an opinion about this movie. Now, Zack Snyder likes the fact that people to this day talk about this movie. But this movie, as much as I love it, destroyed the potential of the franchise. And I'm a DC fan, and I didn't like what was being said about my DC universes and my DC characters. And this film did that. Does this film have a problem? Um, are people right about this film? It's interesting because people, you know, a lot of people who probably know a lot more than me um, point out several issues with this film. It's just trying to tell a real world story of Superman being on Earth and how people would react and how someone like Batman would react. It's a good story. Ultimately, that's not what audiences asked for. One of the big issues with this film for critics and audiences was Superman. Henry Cavill's Superman was very somber. He wasn't the Superman we even remembered from Man of Steel. Don't forget, in Man of Steel, we, we left Henry Cavill's Clark Kent smiling at Lois Lane. Welcome to the planet. So we expected something a lot less somber because we kind of thought he was accepted at that point. But they took it back a bit. And, you know, it was a very somber movie. Um, you know, the opening was fantastic because it continued from the first film. But people wasn't expecting this movie. It's as simple as that. This film destroyed everything. In terms of the broader audience and the broader critics and, and you know, entertainment journalists, this is the film that broke everything. So, all of a sudden, we have big, big problems for this franchise. And the bigger problem is there's another film coming uh, very shortly in the same year of 2016 for this movie. I like this movie. I think it's an amazing movie. It's an indie movie with a blockbuster budget. That's what it is. It's an indie movie with a blockbuster budget and nobody knew this, this is what they were getting. This is the film that tore everything down because this is not what people wanted. Because the MCU changed everything because The Dark Knight made people think, we want darker superhero movies now. But as soon as we had the first Avengers, that mentality changed, and this is not what the broader audience wanted to see. But, Zack is an auteur, he had a vision, and the problem was, Zack wasn't going to stop his vision without a fight. More on that later on. So then this film. This film's trailers were well received. People, even the mainstream audience, saying that's more like it. This is what we want to see. This looks very interesting. And in fact, even Leto's Joker in the trailers was well received. It was once we got into the film that people didn't like Leto's Joker. So we got a film which is, what, just over two hours, two hours, 20 minutes, whatever it is. And, um, well, again, critics destroyed this film. They said the editing was terrible. 
We all know now that this is not David Ayer's movie, and David Ayer's movie was cut to pieces because, quite frankly, this movie, in its full form as David Ayer's Suicide Squad movie, scared the shit out of the studio. Because unless you experience the reaction to Batman vs Superman, you won't understand where the studio were coming from. They were scared. They were scared this movie was going to destroy the franchise even further. Guess what? This cut of the movie destroyed the franchise even further. Now I haven't seen David Ayer's cut, but I suspect even that cut would have caused problems from the broader audience. So we had a big problem. So people loved Margot Robbie's Harley Quinn, Will Smith's Deadshot. They didn't like the fact that the Joker wasn't a villain. David Ayer even coming out admitting that the Joker should have been the villain of the movie. Now, I don't think in his cut, the Joker's even the villain then, but that's what they should have done. So they got it wrong. Now, I don't think we should have ever had a Suicide Squad movie as a third movie to a DC Extended Universe franchise. You know, we could have had an individual movie there. Now, even I argued at the time we didn't need original, you know, original character movies to build up to the Justice League. But I go back on what I said earlier, because you can go back to my YouTube videos in my early days, and I was arguing this point. But the point being, if you don't know the characters by the time you get them in the Justice League, it's not that exciting. The whole idea is of crossovers, oh my God, what would it be like if Superman and Green Lantern were in a movie together? You know, and Green Lantern should have had his own movie pre-Justice League as well. Now, I don't know if that was Snyder's fault or the studio's fault. It sounds like it's both of their faults. But this film as a third movie, this IP simply isn't popular enough. But people didn't like the film. Now, we get a bit of a surprise. Wonder Woman, written by Alan Heinberg, Zack Snyder and directed by Patty Jenkins. This is a female-led superhero movie, but this is one of the best comic book movies ever made. Wow, 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 wow. It's a sensational movie, the critics love it, it makes over 800 million at the global box office, it gets a great Rotten Tomato score. Gal Gadot, a really inexperienced actor, not one of the best out there pre-Wonder Woman, was hailed as a great female lead. This film is a beautiful film. It has wonderful supporting characters. The music by, is it Rupert Gregson Williams, which is one of my favorite composers. He's great with Aquaman, which we'll talk about later on. This is a sensational movie and everybody loves it. And we start to think now, well, maybe the DCEU can be saved because we've still got Justice League. Wonder Woman's gonna be in it. You know, it's gonna be a great movie. Let's see what they do with, you know, with Justice League. But this movie was hailed as one of the best people had ever seen. And it is. That, and one of the key elements is Chris Pine as a co-lead. Having a male lead with an inexperienced actress was very, very important. I wonder what that, how that film would have worked without Steve Trevor, without Chris Pine, and we'll never know. So Chris Pine wasn't really given any credit for the success of this film, but he really should have done. So Wonder Woman is a great movie, and despite people hating the third act, I thought it was a wonderful third act, and her having to decide to choose love at the end was a beautiful moment as well. So this is a great movie. Everyone's happy all of a sudden. I come out of the cinema, I, I hold my phone up and start doing videos. I'm so excited for the DCEU again. Maybe we can fix things. Maybe everything will be all right. Well, that's what I thought. But then we get to this film, which isn't the film we saw. This is Zack Snyder's Justice League Snyder Cut. More on that shortly. So, the story of the Justice League movie is part of WB trying to fix what they felt was a clusterfuck. So, Zack Snyder did a script with Chris Terrio. They didn't like it. They kept on sending them away to do more and more and more, and they simply didn't like what they got. In the end, he did a script. He shot his movie mainly in London. We saw kind of the um, sizzle reel, didn't we, of Zack rapping and everything. It was very, very exciting. We got lots of trailers. Then it was announced by Zack Snyder that because of the tragic suicide of his daughter, Autumn, 
he, he thought he could continue, but he couldn't. He was leaving because of that reason. Of course, the truth later on would be more deeper and darker than that, that Zack Snyder never really wanted to move, move on from the film because of the suicide of his daughter. I'm sure it was very hard for him and Deb, and my thoughts and prayers go out to them even now after all this time. But the, the dark truth was that Zack was forced off the production. And they brought in Joss Whedon to rewrite and direct the reshoots that he made. Now, we were told this was still Zack's movie and Zack's good friend, Joss Whedon, would come in to polish things up and finish it off. This was, of course, a lie because they believed they were in a big mess with Snyder. They didn't believe, uh, you know, after the feel-good situation with Wonder Woman, they didn't want to go back to square one again with Justice League. Now, what's interesting about Zack Snyder's Justice League, the broader audience quite enjoyed this film. But one of the reasons that is, is because they're comparing it to Whedon's reshoot. So Whedon's reshooted film, I went to see it, very excited. And uh, the opening of the film is, is okay, if you like. And um, it's only when I start seeing the green screen backgrounds looking fake, and it's obvious that this was a rushed movie. You know, Warner Brothers made a big mistake. If you're going to bring in Joss Whedon, right, what should have happened after they got rid of Snyder? on Justice League. They should have just said, you know what, Joss Whedon is, you know, we've had creative, they should have been honest, we've had creative differences with Zack Snyder, you know, Joss is going to make his own movie. Now at that point, that would have been really good because you had to, you could fall back on the feel good factor of Wonder Woman. And you know, Suicide Squad and BBS could be put down to experience. At that point, you could still do that. So if Joss Whedon wrote and directed his own Justice League movie, they may have still got away with it. We later found out from Ray Fisher that the reshoots had a toxic environment to them. Everyone was falling out. It just wasn't working. And he and Joss Whedon simply didn't get on from the very, very beginning. And ultimately, the that moment began when one person from Wales, I think, hashtag released the Snyder Cut. And that hashtag became legend. So we fought, we fought, we fought. We got Aquaman. That's when I first started my channel. And I told you I saw Aquaman before everyone else. And I was very, very um, privileged to go to a test screening. And I loved that film. James Wan did a great job. Walter Hamada had taken over the DCEU as DC Films president straight after Justice League. And he and James Wan worked very well together in reformatting the Aquaman movie. Now, James did consult with Zack Snyder because he'd still be an executive producer on the film, but this was James Wan's movie, and this was the writers, the people who wrote the film as well. So, Zack's people wrote the film, and pretty much James directed it, but his visuals for the film were beautiful. I have a lot of time for the Aquaman movie. We'll talk about that shortly. So, you have this whole campaign just after Walter Hamada's taken over. Very shortly after, Anne Sarnoff takes over as chief chair of Warner of um, Warner Brothers Pictures. Later on, it would be Warner Media as A and T and T take over. And as A T and T take over, the, the the release the Snyder Cut movement has more moment, momentum. They welcome Anne Sarnoff to the studio with flowers and letters. They start writing and phoning up AT&T asking if they can release the Snyder Cut. And AT&T, you know, being very interesting, saying, we, you know, well, we'll have to wait and see. We started getting kind of, well, this could happen. Ultimately, as HBO Max was formed, they needed something to launch it with. And it was announced. It was announced that Zack Snyder's Justice League would be... Um, I think in four episodes over on HBO Max. Now, things got very interesting near to the time of the release of that movie when it was decided that, the, that it would be released as a movie and not episodes. Now, as I've said to you before, when it was released as episodes, it was Warner Brothers and AT&T's full intention to release a Justice League 2 and a Justice League 3 in episodes on HBO Max. But Ray Fisher was pushing for an investigation that didn't like the way the investigation went on the Joss Whedon reshoots. And it, it was a calamity. Zack Snyder was taking liberties. He was shooting new scenes. They told him not to shoot new scenes. As much as I love those new scenes, 
Zack Snyder's Justice League Snyder Cut is a fucking beautiful success. It's a great film and nobody can argue anything else. But in comparison to Justice League, you would say anything was a good film. But this is a beautiful movie. There's no question about that. I like Zack Snyder's DCEU trilogy. But at the end of the day, for the broader audience and as a business model, it simply doesn't work. So it was then decided that Zack Snyder would no longer be involved in the DCEU. I thought there was hope during the build-up of the Snyder Cup. But unfortunately, Snyder and Ray Fisher just totally pissed off the studio. And let's go back a bit and talk about Ray Fisher attacking Walter Hamada, you know, the DC film president. At the end, Warner Brothers took this personally, and that was it. Fisher was out. Well, Fisher claimed he wouldn't work with any production under Walter Hamada, and Warner Brothers had had enough of Zack Snyder. So he was gone. Just after this released, two things happened. One, that Anne Sarnoff, the chief chair of Warner Media Film Productions, um, did a big interview with Variety, claiming that they were proud that Zack got to make his trilogy, even though the whole world knew he had a five-movie plan, and said they would be moving on. They were now setting up a franchise where all departments making these films would sit in one room, exchanging ideas, like a, you know, a huge writer's room or something, and they had big plans. Then the pandemic hit. I'm not even saying the story of the DCEU in order, but we'll go back to Aquaman. But actually, we won't go back to it. We will go back to Aquaman, right? Because I'm getting ahead of myself. So then we go to Aquaman. Now, Aquaman's a very interesting film. Shall I tell you why this is interesting? You know, including it being an awesome movie, right? And I love this movie. This movie, after the flop that is Justice League, made over a billion dollars. That is unprecedented. This is the most successful DC, DCEU movie of all time. That is sensational. I believe it deserves it. I think it's a great movie. The broader audience loved it. Critics mostly liked it, apart from Collider, who called it a mess. But it, at that point, it didn't matter. Rotten Tomato scores were great. Critics' views were great. The audience loved it. DC fans loved it. They felt this is the Aquaman from the comics. He may not look like the Aquaman from the comics, but the feel and the zest of the movie, the groundbreaking visuals of um, you know, Atlantis were sensational, and Rupert Gregson Williams was back doing the music. And I'm a bit sad he's not doing the Flash movie as well. Another conversation for another time. But anyway... This film was hailed a success. So, Walter Hamada's reign had started with a big success. And suddenly, everyone was happy again. The DCEU would keep plodding along. And I don't know a franchise or a TV series to have so many issues and problems to keep limping on. It's sensational. So then, we go, really... Well, no, I won't say that. I was going to say the final great DCEU movie, but that wouldn't be fair. Right, Shazam. Shazam is a film directed by David F. Sandberg. I forgot who wrote the story. I think David may have co-wrote the story as well. Shazam is a film made for children and families. And people said David F. Sandberg, a former horror director, couldn't pull it off. Of course, Dick Donner, who did Superman the movie, also... Uh, was a horror director. He directed the first Omen movie, a great movie, by the way, starring Gregory Peck. But anyway, Sandberg took this film and adapted the former Captain Marvel in a great way. And not only that, celebrated the entire of the DCEU. You know, we had Freddie Freeman mentioning Superman, Batman using Superman, uh, Batman's Batarang. Um, Freddie actually had the bullet casing. Um, from BVS as well. There were lots of winks and nods and easter eggs to the other DCEU movies and that was great. This film is a great movie for the family and they've just wrapped on Shazam 2 Fury of the Gods as well. So this film was celebrated. This film cost under a hundred million to make. The budget was very low. Something we know Walter Hamada is very good at. This film made just over 300 million. A very low figure 
but it made twice its budget, which means this was a huge success for the studio and they commissioned the sequel straight away. This film is a success. Zachary Levi was a success. Um, Asher Angel was a success. The cast was a success. The kids were adorable. You know, anyone who loves to be entertained and loves superhero movies loved this film. It was a big success. It was not a flop. No matter how many times you say it, this was a success. So again, we can. Walter Hamada, as DC president, in his second film, ended up being very successful for two films in a row. It looked like the tide was turning. Then, before we continue the story of the DCEU, we'll talk about something else. Then, the third movie in the reign of Walter Hamada would be a Joker film. It's set in an Elseworld starring Joaquin Phoenix as Arthur Fleck playing this Elseworld version of Joker and directed by Todd Phillips, a comedy director. So people again said, how can, you know, this director who's done comedy, you know, successfully make a dark Joker movie? Joker is one of the best films I've ever seen, let alone one of the best comic book movies I've ever seen. I've definitely put it in modern day terms alongside, in terms of, the, of DC, with Wonder Woman 2017. So that was a success, although Walter Hamada had doubts about it, he was worried about it interfering with the central DC universe, but ultimately the film got made, um, the film was a success under Walter Hamada's reign, again Walter Hamada managed that film to be made under a low budget, congratulations to him and Todd Phillips for doing that, and it made a huge profit, it made over a billion dollars. There was controversy about this film that people shouldn't go and see it. They said, you know, you know, incels would go to the movie and maybe there could be a terrible incident there. Nothing of the sort happened. It's a beautiful movie about a man suffering with mental illness and looking after his sick, ill mother and, you know, being pushed too far. It's inspired by, you know, Mean Streets and Taxi Driver. It's a great movie. Now let's go back to the DCEU, right? Because the story continues, but things start to turn sour for Walter Hamada. Because after the Ray Fisher thing, people start turning on Walter Hamada because people started celebrating Walter Hamada. But all of a sudden, Ray Fisher changed that narrative and a lot of Snyder fans were going for Paul Walter. And it would get worse for Paul Walter as well. As we entered, Birds of Prey and the fantabulous emancipation of one Harley Quinn. So what happened here? Margot Robbie has a production company called Lucky Chap. Yeah, Lucky Chap. I wonder what that means. I don't, I don't want to work it out. Anyway, she would produce this movie. She would be fully in charge of this movie. She would make the decisions of this movie. That's a decision that Walter Hamada and the studio decided. I suspect this was more the studio's decision than Walter's decision. Something else he was probably worried about and warned them. He's a very smart guy. Anyway, she brought in Kathy Yan, a director who did a couple of good indie movies. Um, but ultimately, Kathy wasn't very proficient at shooting action. And when Warner Brothers saw the first rough cut of this movie, they were as scared sh shitless as the first Suicide Squad movie and BVS. And they brought in the John Wick director to fix things a little bit. This movie made a little over 200 million, making a slight profit. And just before COVID, and you can't blame COVID for this, this film was an absolute disaster. This film, of course, has its fans and it's done really well on HBO Max. I must say this. I think this is an okay movie. It's quite entertaining. It's not one of the best I've seen, not one of the worst I've seen. But the anti-male commentary, of course, was a big issue for this film. And that, that was set by um, Harley Quinn, Margot Robbie. But it's an okay movie. It's an okay movie. It's not a terrible movie by any stretch of the imagination. But unfortunately, this film didn't make the money. And it was also a very standalone-ish movie. It did kind of take themes from the first Suicide Squad. Ultimately, people didn't like this movie, or enough people didn't even go and watch it. They didn't even care if they saw this movie or not. That's the problem. By having no continuity, not creating an arc for the first phase of the DCEU, Snyder had an arc, but Snyder was gone by now. This was the mess of having an auteur you had no faith in, and now the leader of that story has gone, and you're trying to move away from that story. That's the problem. The first Justice League tried to fix everything in two hours. 
and under the same filming schedule that Snyder had, it was never going to work. An absolute calamity. Everyone, everyone was to blame for this, and this was another step back. Then we go to this one. Wonder Woman 84, co-written by uh, Patty Jenkins and directed by Patty Jenkins and also co-written by Jeff Johns. By now, Jeff Johns didn't have um, a very good reputation with a lot of Snyder fans. But they went to work on this movie. This film was supposed to be released in the summer, if I remember rightly. Was it the summer of 2020? If I, was it? Was, no. Was it last year? Yeah, no, 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 no. This film was supposed to be released in 2019. I think it was supposed to be released in 2019. Anyway, 2019 or 2020. They decided they weren't ready to release it, so they delayed it. This was very mysterious because a little bit later after that, or pre this, um, um, you know, film blogger, YouTube film blogger Grace Randolph claimed that they were going to reset the entire DCEU in this movie and do a Flashpoint story. Did they decide this, then change their minds and decide to do it on the flash because it made more sense? Maybe, we will never know, and maybe that's why they delayed the movie. This is totally Patty Jenkins' film, but I can't believe the same person who directed the first Wonder Woman... No, let me say this again. The person who directed this had anything to do with the first Wonder Woman. I don't get it. This film goes to 1984. Well, I lived 1984. Now, I wasn't in America in 1984, but the styles and the attitudes were certainly unrecognisable to the 80s. At the 80s and the 1984 I saw via TV in America and Hollywood movies. It was like we were on a, another planet. That's why when I saw the trailers I thought, well, maybe 1984 is another world or, some, or something freaky like that. And that actually would have been a, a really good idea. That was one of my earlier theories, if you remember. So Wonder Woman 84... Um, was a very problematic movie. It had lots of plot holes. The way they brought back Steve Trevor didn't work for the audience. The quantum leap scenario, her, you know, basically sleeping with another man who had Steve Trevor inside him sounds like gross, doesn't it? It was a messy situation when all she had to do was bring Steve Trevor back. Just say, right, you wish for it, he's there. But the so the the whole premise of the wishing and all of it simply didn't work. Critics called this a success story, the right film at the right time. But Rotten Tomatoes scores were very high when it was first released, but shrunk down very quickly. That proves maybe that access media are being forced sometimes by the studios to talk things up. And later on, um, the, you know, the Rotten Tomatoes scores goes down with nobody, nobody knowing. This film has a very emotional, good third act. But the rest of the film, apart from the Fimiscaria opening sequence with the wonderfully talented uh, child actress Lily Espel, apart from that, this film was just not a very good film, a very dull film. Um, I just, I mean, the, the villains of the film, Maxwell Lord and Cheetah, I mean, you know, Maxwell Lord was portrayed well. He was an interesting character, but he's not the Maxwell Lord at all from the comics. Because Patty Jenkins isn't interested in the comics, she wanted to tell the story of a fictional Donald Trump in 1984, and that's a shame. At the end of the day, we were being lectured in this film about being greedy and wanting too much, when the industry that Patty works in is the most greedy, self-serving industry in the whole world. This film had so many issues, and I'm not going to talk about them, but this film this director had so much hatred for the first film she directed, the first Wonder Woman film that I claimed earlier is one of the best comic book movies of all time. She made a mess of it and she shouldn't touch a Wonder Woman film again, but in Hollywood they fail upwards and I'm sure we'll see her again for the third movie. By the way, because this is not really a newsy DCEU daily today because there's not much going on, but I can reveal, if you don't know already, that Gal Gadot yesterday was seen at Warner Brothers and she is filming her sequences for the Flash movie. Now, I don't know if the other Justice League are there. That'll be an interesting discussion for another time. So I'm excited to have Gal back. So that's awesome. So that's that film. Then all of a sudden, the pandemic hit. And DC Fandom happened for the first time last year. And it was very, very exciting. 
a convention that you could watch on your laptop, on your tablet, on your phone, and you could watch it absolutely free no matter where you were in the world, celebrating these DC universes and these DC characters. Very shortly before that, it was announced that James Gunn would write and direct a Suicide Squad sequel, reboot, whatever they were fucking talking about, right? But it was exciting. He'd been sacked from Marvel, and Walter Hamada took a punt on him. So we thought, wow, this guy's going to make a billion dollar movie. As we all talk about, as we get to that film, very shortly, that didn't happen. But we were all very excited. The one fact that we missed, of course, about the Suicide Squad IP, is not something that people are clamoring to watch. If you've seen one Suicide Squad movie, you've, you know, you've seen them all. James Gunn made a wonderful movie, which I really enjoyed and watched twice and pre-ordered immediately on 4K Blu-ray. But ultimately, people in America stayed at home, watched it via, you know, HBO Max for a record amount of times. It's been a huge success financially on HBO Max via sponsorship and subscriptions. We know that. And the international box office is very healthy, but the American domestic box office wasn't healthy at all. So you could, I mean, I mean, theatrically, it is a flop. But in terms of the all-round money it's made, it's certainly not a flop. He's already made an HBO Max um, miniseries, season one he's calling it, of Peacemaker starring John Cena, which we'll, we will get more details of at DC Fandom on October the 16th, which I'm very excited about. So I liked what he did. Anyway, I'm kind of saying things out of context as we continue the story of the DCEU. But the big, big news was, just before we saw the Suicide Squad, just before DC Fandom and on DC Fandom, Andy Machete was announced to direct the Flash movie. Andy Machete has a very short and not so vast directorial career. But what his claim to fame is, the IT reboot and IT Chapter 2, continuing from the first movie. The first IT movie was celebrated. Andy Machete is clearly a very good director. But then we were shocked to find something else out, that this would actually adapt the Flashpoint graphic novel, not copy and paste it, but that's what they were doing. They were doing Flashpoint. But then he shot Andy Machete and his sister Barbara, who is his, you know, his business partner, shocked every fan who watches a movie and said, this would kind of reset the DCEU. Then my imagination was captivated and I knew exactly what was going on. They were going to reboot the DCEU using Flashpoint, something that I and many fans suggested during the clusterfuck of the whole, uh, you know, the early stages of the DCEU. And that's exactly what they were going to do. And then they shocked us even more again because via Flashpoint, Michael Keaton would reprise his role as Batman. So all of a sudden they announced four movies for 2022, although the Batman should have hit this year. Now going back to Matt Reeves doing the Batman, now this was a Jeff Johns decision. When he was running, uh, when he was running DC as a whole, he went to Matt Reeves. Now they wanted him to use Ben Affleck, but he didn't. He wanted his own Batman in his own universe, so they allowed him to do whatever he wanted. Then when COVID hit and they did the day and date, Matt said, listen, if you do day and date with me, I'm gone and you'll have to bring another director in. Of course, they didn't want to do that. So Walter Hamada made the decision to delay the Batman till March 2022, where it will have a 45 day theatrical window. And quite right, too. So Matt Reeves will now headline the first movie, DC movie of 2022, which is not set in DCEU Earth 1. And then we will go to Black Adam, which is a very exciting movie. And then we will go to Flashpoint. And then we will go to Aquaman and The Lost Kingdom. And in 2023, the first movie, I should think, is Am Shazam Fury of the Gods. So we are now up to date. This was the story of the DCEU. A story of twists and turns and, you know, executive engagements and terrible decisions. But the worst decision was from the very beginning when Christopher Nolan came to them and said, my friend David S. Goyer has an idea for a Superman movie. But he said, I don't want to direct it on Mold the Clay of the Universe. That's when they said, sorry, no, 
We'll take your French script, we might adapt it for ourselves, but hey, we're going to bring someone in to run this universe, and that's the end of it. Let me reiterate what I said at the beginning of the video. Autors do not make very good leaders. They're leaders on the set, on location when they're directing their film, that's great. But auteur directors, directors running a huge franchise like the DC, the DC Extended Universe is no good. And it should never have been allowed from the very beginning. And we saw what happened. It's not about whether I like Zack's DC movies or not because I love them and adore them. We have to be honest, I'm a DC fan. And having an auteur, having two auteurs at the beginning running this franchise was the biggest mistake they could ever make. Look what we've got now. We've got Snyder fans running around on Twitter, bashing the studio, bashing other actors, bashing directors, and it's never going to stop. So this reboot is the best thing we can do. This has been the DCEU Daily here on Movies TV Mad. I'm Mick, your host with the most. Just ask your girlfriends and your wives. I will be back in the next video. Remember to like, share, comment, subscribe, Smash the notification bell so you never miss this perfection. And I will see you again soon. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at Movies TV Mad, on Instagram at Movies TV Mad Triple Five, and on TikTok at Movies TV Mad Triple X. I will see you again in the next video. I hope you enjoyed this one. And if you like this, please subscribe and please tell people about me and get as many people to watch the videos as possible. Until then, until I see you again, goodbye.